Hola Yuha Ichicha Lila Chante Mawaste na Yuha Chante Washte na Nape Chayus Papelo Ake Lila Daya Hipelo. It's it's really, really good to see you. It's really good to be with you tonight. Today is Giving Tuesday, and this is the Wopila gathering. We really this was an idea that I had a few years ago, I believe in 2019, and, and we wanted to do this in person, you know, to start it off in, in, in California, on the West Coast, the best coast, some might even say the left coast, but we wanted to start there and, and move it to the Ocheti Shakomi, or the Republic of the Lakota Chesapa Makoche. The sacred black hills of our nation. You know, we, we have a responsibility to, to give back to those that are helping us, to, do, to those that are helping strengthen our voices, our collective voice, our impact, those who give us the courage to be bold, to, to be unedited, unadulterated, and and to give you the real substance of who we are as a people. Now, the Lakota People's Law Project has, has a long history. You know, I joined 10 years ago, and it was existing before I got here, and it's my honor to, to be involved with the organization, with the Romero Institute for this long. And so we wanted to gather some of our, our talents that we're honored to work with for, for this long. That includes Phyllis Young, who, who uh, you know, is the subject or one of the subjects of the Oyate documentary film, uh, End of the Line, the, the Women of Standing Rock. And she's, she's got a stellar record of advocating for our nation. Not only the Ocheti Shakoi, but, you know, what is now known as the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe uh, humanity. Madonna Thunderhawk is joining us tonight. She is one of the co-creators of the Women of All Red Nations. Uh, she is involved with Warrior Women. That is a documentary that, that you can, you should see that. Because it will detail, go into more depth of the work that that our elders have done, and and I really want to to give them accolades because they've sacrificed a lot over the years. We have Decora Hawk, who is one of our organizers. She's she's been with us probably coming up on a year now, and we're really grateful to have her assistance. And then uh, some, you know, Danny Paul Nelson will be on one of the panels with me about voting. But, but you know, I, I, maybe you've already viewed kind of what the evening will look like. And, and we're asking you to spend two hours with us and to learn what we've been able to do because of your support on this Giving Tuesday 2022. You could be anywhere else in the known and unknowable universe. And you are here with us tonight. So it's my honor to ask Chief Bear Cross of the Ghost Nation to provide us with a, an appropriate invocation. This is a very good brother of mine, and I'm honored that he's able to join us tonight. And, and with that, I want to turn the floor over, so to speak, to my brother, Chief Bear Cross. Aho metaki oyapi leo petuki leh tatuki wakha ash pilama apolo leo petuki leh tatuki how relatives chante washte na pechi use apo la kho chaje mit khaki mat kho e i am from the pine ridge indian reservation I want to say thank you to all the people around the world across Turtle Island and in indigenous country. 
I want to welcome, and I want to welcome the Lakota way of life. The Lakota way of life to the world, so the people will have a better understanding that our way of life has been here on Turtle Island for a very, very long time. We want to pray for all the murdered, missing Indigenous women and children. We want to pray for all the water protectors. We want to pray for the people that are battling for us that are doing the ICWA. We want to pray for them. We want to pray for all the people that are suffering out there. My friends and relatives, my message today is that unity and peace, we need to look at the what's going on so we could fix Mother Earth. Oh, today we are going to say a prayer. Le oyate, tua oyate, dona oyate ya hippi, le hae piki, wo washte unk upot hunkashila. We chose on the walkie, now wang lake wana ri. Wa kat 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 kaka hae yoi, chae waki ye lo. Wakiyoi <laughs> Pilama Apolo Wakangli, Pilama Apolo Wakia, Pilama Apolo Wamakushka, Pilama Apolo Wanuki Oyate, Mitaki Oye Oyasi. All my relations. I want to turn it back over to my brother Chase Iron Eyes. Me and him sundance together. Me and him go to Inipi together. We sing together. We practice. So this man and Chuck, they are all good people. Phyllis, you are all good people. So I want to say, encourage all of you to continue to do the work for the people. Oh, had you do. This pipeline is illegal and we need to stop it. First of all, I just want to thank the Great Plains Water Alliance for um, allowing this meeting to happen. And I deeply appreciate the tribal chairs and the tribal leadership for coming we cannot move forward unless we have all the tribes together in one mind, one prayer. All of your tribes have treaty rights that are infringed by Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and I just think that's, that's an, an important point. Pause will end at some point. There's going to be a draft EIS that everybody's going to have to respond to. Some of the ammunition for that fight will get discussed this afternoon. We saw the divisive tactics of different government agencies. And, you know, by our very nature as Ocheti Shakawi, we always worked together. We always worked with each other, and we always made sure that we kind of had each other's back, especially on issues like this. And by being here today, we're actually all in the same room uniting around one message and coming up with the strategy to move forward.
we need to make it so where not only the oil stops flowing through it, but also that, that pipe needs to be removed out from under the river. And I can't understand and believe that we're allowing the core that does not own the riverbed to make these decisions. I really believe that we can't go forward unless we go forward with all the tribes, the Ochete Shikoi. We have to do this together. And right now, in 2022, the water war has begun. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings to this segment of the discussion tonight. Uh, my name is Dan Nelson. I am co-director of Lakota People's Law Project, along with Chase Iron Eyes. I believe that Chase will be joining us again momentarily. It looks like he just lost reception temporarily. Uh, but I'm privileged to introduce my very uh, esteemed and dear colleague, Phyllis Young, uh, who is at Standing Rock now. Um, Phyllis has an incredibly impressive career, uh, stretching back decades uh, as one of the early American Indian movement leaders, as well as uh, the woman who was among those who led the No Dapple uh, effort uh, at Standing Rock. She was the official tribal liaison for Standing Rock to the camps, No Dapple camps. Uh, and she's also worked on a variety of issues throughout her life, uh, water being among them. Uh, Phyllis was also a council member at Standing Rock back in 2012 for four years. Uh, Phyllis, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you. Um, again, Chase will join us again soon, I hope. But for the moment, uh, you and I can have this discussion here about water issues. And I'd like to just turn it over to you uh, to speak on topics that you consider to be important to your current work uh, as one of our organizers and also in other capacities that you operate in. Uh, at Standing Rock. Uh, one thing I'm sure that our audience will be quite interested in is uh, the current status of the Dakota Access Pipeline and the tribe's struggle against that pipeline, the ongoing struggle. Uh, so perhaps you have some things to say about where that struggle sits today. Um, can you hear me, Phyllis? Yes. Excellent. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet here and listen to you. Thank you. Uh, Chante was saying up a choose up a mini tehio we himachiapi na mini yuha naji we himachiapi. I'm hunk, I'm i hunktua Lakota and hunkwapa Lakota, and I reside here on Standing Rock. Um, so mini wichoni, mini wichoni is a spiritual law that. derives from Wope, the law, the female law, the governance of Ochete Shakui. And with that, we have an obligation as women to promote and protect um, the water. And that includes um, the water for Mother Earth, all of the rivers, streams, and byways of, of Mother Earth. And that includes uh, the power derived from the stars for women, and that power being all women, all, cho all living things are born in water. And the human, human being is is born in water. And so we are miracles that coexist in uh, at the beginning of life, um, breathing inside our mothers and swimming and moving in water. So uh, very sacred concept of life and birth at the beginning. So we learned in 1990, I learned from the elders at Uglala Nation um, about the spiritual connection. And uh, we helped to build Miniwichoni 
drinking water pipeline uh, in South Dakota. And it was uh, the efforts and initiative of Ogallala Nation to bring that clean drinking water derived from Minisoche. And we had an obligation to ensure that it was uh, provided to our people as well as others um, to be responsible for the operation and maintenance of that and to always protect the source of that water. So that was my lesson uh, from Ogala Nation in, in the helping build a pipeline and uh, which ultimately became the biggest drinking water pipeline. So with that um, growing knowledge of, as women of all red nations, taking back, organizing, mobilizing, and challenging evermore the issue of water uh, at the direction of Chief Fools Crow. Uh, he, he, he taught us the beliefs derived from the freedom that we lived uh, for generations. And that was what Women of All Red Nations did in 1980 was to cite the contamination of the Cheyenne River um, from the uranium mining in 1980. And the CDC uh, stated that we were alarmists and um, we continued to defy um, the tests and the levels of poison in the water. And so we put forth our, our water study back in, in 1980. So we've been hard at it to protect um, the water. And we also marched and rallied and protested in 1972 in the Trail of Broken Treaties um, to, with the 20 points that demand it, uh, the rights be recognized by the United States in marching to Washington, D.C. and telling them. Uh, so defying the public policies prohibiting us from our customary law and our prayer, our, our um, belief systems, and our language. And so we organized at the direction of Chief Fools Crow, um, be it under um, the critical notion of that was being imposed on us, which was the sterilization of Native women. So that was the, the critical issue at that time. And in Lakota tradition, we um, only women can speak to the issue of women, be it reproductive rights, um, be it abortion um, and sterilization. So we, we travel to every fora in the countries we testified before the um, Russell Tribunal at Free University in Holland and the Congress of the United States, which ended in, resulted in a moratorium and eventually prohibition of that sterilization. Long story short, more women and men were sterilized in Ocheti Shakoni. So it it's has many segments and much context to it in terms of um, the issue of water, um, having been born in water and uh, following the spiritual law and karma um, that comes with that. So we filed against the Etsy pipeline in 1980 and we filed against uh, Union Carbide in 1980. We were plaintiffs as women of all red nations with the Farmers, Ranchers, and Cowboys and Indians Alliance. And so we prevailed. We, were, we won those cases. And when you have that taste of justice and freedom and righteousness, um, you want no less. 
So you have a very high standard of principles that we have to pursue in the protection of that, and we continue to do that. So we have been um, opposed to four pipelines uh, who cross our territory. And so um, we, since 2007, we have opposed every pipeline that has uh, attempted to cross Mini Sose. And um, so that is the northern border gas line, the um, Keystone pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline, and DAPL. So um, we continue. We are moving forward with another lawsuit. Um, our water is down 12 feet. Um, when the water is high, higher, uh, two feet higher north of us and four feet higher south of us. So um, we continue to, to seek legislation, um, create legislative language to uh, initiate Article 11, Proviso 6 of the 1868 Treaty, which says for um, any utility that crosses our territory, uh, there will be a commission uh, created there will be an assessment done by a commission created of five people, one of whom shall be the headman or chief of the tribe. And that, uh, that is a mandate at the highest order. So we, we continue to seek that at the congressional level. Uh, we, we are petitioning for a a full-blown uh, hearing before the OAS, the Organization of American States, um, whose original objective was for the protection of indigenous peoples in the Western Hemisphere. Um, our attorney has um, passed, and so we are seeking an attorney to uh, continue um, the petition that we submitted to the Human Rights Council on DAPL in 2016, 17, 16. <laughs> so I just, um, we continue at different levels. Um, we still are on our path uh, to protect that water. So I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Phyllis. Uh, and I do apologize. I. I just dropped off signal, but I'm, I'm on a, a decent signal now, so I should be with you throughout the duration. Uh, many of our support network people listening in, people who already know about DAPL, um, will know exactly where Phyllis is coming from. When Phyllis talks about Mani Wichoni, I've heard about you know uh, another word called Tamani. Um, water you know and even science is i, I saw something uh, an article in some journal about establishing that water is older than the sun and that is you know that that's that it's another one of these instances where indigenous peoples are sitting in their in their recliners and saying oh great western civilization has arrived has discovered something that we've known for like that's part of our most basic creation knowledge is that water is 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 older than the sun for instance it's there, it goes much deeper than that um in our language it's called otokahe kagapi you know the beginning the first beginnings but through the standing rock sioux tribe you know that is what the governmental body is known as of this what is now called the standing rock nation that's not a very old, these designations are not very old, but what is old is the water. And because Chairwoman Janet Alkire of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe withdrew the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe from the, the cooperating agency status with the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, now this, a lot of people might not, you know, pay close attention or have Google Alert signed up, uh, uh, turned on for anytime Dapple or Standing Rock 
makes the news. But to provide a very quick legal update, I was able to travel to Washington, D.C. with leadership elected leadership of the standing rock sioux tribe who along with their technical experts interfaced with members of the united states congress members and or staff of the united states senate representatives of the army corps of engineers these are all the folks that permitted this illegal pipeline in the first place and and the history of it is so convoluted that we would we would just ask that you go to our website or go to the standing rock sioux tribes website to try to find out just how through the court system through all of the advocacy work that that we do on the ground you know in in standing in the ocheti shakoe in washington dc and right now, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the Oglala Sioux Tribe and the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, they're all named parties in the lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers. And so they, as far as I know, there are no more cooperating tribes with the Army Corps of Engineers. That's, it's a process where you get, you know, at, you're supposed to get access to all of the critical information that you need to make informed decisions for the future of your people, of your constituency. And that, you know, I don't know why Standing Rock entered into that cooperating agency status, but that was the prerogative of a different administration, a, a, a different tribal council. And J Chairwoman Elkire pulled the Standing Rock Sioux tribe out of that because the Army Corps wasn't telling us the truth. The Army Corps of Engineers was not giving, was not being forthright and upright about the information that we needed, our people on the ground need, not just at Standing Rock, but at Cheyenne River. We all depend on the mini soche. So we need critical information to know how to best respond to a potential catastrophic spill. We have a series with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe called the Dakota Water Wars. And we have other iterations of that in the works, not only with other tribal governments who who came to being, you know, 88 years ago. We're also working with that ancient traditional leadership and, and sovereignty that is expressed not only by our elders, but people like Chief Bear Cross, P Phyllis referenced Chief Frank Fool's Crow, that same struggle. That that is 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 in our hands right now. Right now in South Dakota, the governor of South Dakota is trying to build a six foot diameter pipeline to pipe Missouri River water to the western part of the state when we're all in the middle of a drought. In the southwest, rivers are drying up. I have people who say here the, the White River, which is right within our treaty territory. Is dry right now. There are there are places where there is no river. It's all underground in the, in the underground water table, and it resurfaces somewhere else. But the point is that if we don't stand up for our rights, if we don't create conscious activation of 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 our DNA and and of our blood, our flesh and blood in our bones, if we don't create that action, the state. The federal government, they will ignore indigenous rights to the detriment of all humanity. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll end my little soapbox piece like this, that we are paying very close attention. We are working directly through and with, when it's appropriate, with Chairwoman Alkire and the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance. That's Doug Krogost. That's the, the, you know, Syed, that's the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, the Oglala Sioux Tribe, and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. There are other tribes that are involved, but um, we're working directly with them. I just went to one of their meetings to make sure that, you know, and that's what I heard there was the fact that the governor of South Dakota is trying to steal water, like a lot of uh, millions of acre feet of water from us. And they're not even trying to involve us in the process whatsoever. In the meantime, 
we're paying attention and we're trying to support Standing Rock in their quest to get a fully accurate and honest environmental impact statement, which the court has now said, yes, the Army Corps has, has to produce this EIS. But our position is that if there's no EIS, then that pipeline is illegal. We all know that, but big oil and the war machine is a very powerful lobby. And that's, that's how, you know, indigenous people, indigenous nations can, can punch way above our weight because the American people are beginning to spiritually awaken. This is just my personal perspective. They are ready for what we have to share with them. And, and really, we've been willing to share it since contact. But things didn't pan out that way. But it's not, I mean, 500 years, not a long time. This is still in our hands, not only indigenous rights, but our democracy, the state of our Republican form of government, you know, the, the strength of the, what is the United States Constitution. All of that is in our hands, as well as indigenous sovereignty and, and making things right with native people. So we're, we're, we're paying close attention to that. And I just wanted to say that, um, you know, every time I get a chance to do a session with Phyllis, um, she's, she's known me since I was real, real little, you know, I used to go to her house and, uh, there was no sugar in that house. There was no ketchup in that house. Um, she was doing vegan and organic and all of that stuff before we, anyone even knew what that was. And so, uh, they, they stood up. It's because they sacrificed that we're here, you know, standing on their shoulders today, uh, ready to do the work and to carry on that legacy but you know we're, we're we're keeping a close eye on the dakota access pipeline i'll just cut out there phyllis so i just will add quickly that the connection to climate change um our creation stories were not accepted as science back in the day and now they're quoting our creation stories because we having taken back our our religious uh, freedom, spirituality, um, we are totally connected to the universe. We, um, we were sun worshipers. We always have been. And we were prohibited from worshiping the sun for 60 years. That's three generations. So now uh, people are beginning to understand the connection. It's not, oh, it's terrible weather, it's raining. Uh, these are blessings rain, snow, hail um, are all blessings and our, our ancestors all carry these names. Um, we are universal people. Uh, we are a, um, a pluralistic society and um, we have a beautiful belief system where we have to treat everyone alike. We have rules um, that we have to follow, and that includes respect for Mother Earth, uh, for all living things. And um, if we don't, um, Mother Earth is it, what is happening with climate change is the natural order that she is protecting herself. That is, she is cleansing herself, which is um, which does elimination. She does not discriminate against anyone, which is our law incorporated. So um, we, the access is slanted now. And so over time, what is that telling us? Um, we're looking at four places on earth that don't have gravity. How are we going to create uh, a manifold with uh, technology that will hold that gravity in place. Um, water, magnetic fields are intric intricately connected. And so when we talk about climate change, we're talking about the health of our mother and um, desperately need to hold that. So um, in this desperate hour, I did a presentation on quantification. We quantified Mini Soche uh, in 1975. Uh, Standing Rock, I will say 1.3 million acre feet of water. Uh, we claimed um, Ocheti Shakoi divided it up according to 
the property right that we have in the 1868 treaty. Um, so we're the only people in, in the entire world that respects the natural flow. Quantification is a scary word if you interpret it based on Western law. And it's not Western law. It's the natural order of Mother Earth. And the natural flows will be recognized in our quantification code. It will be derived from spirituality. And it will recognize living things and um, all, all humanity. So um, we need to look at that. And that quantification code, we... We have agreements with um, the Congress of the United States. Um, we don't intend to use fear that that has been a, a tactic against us. We are moving fearlessly forward because we have a deep sense of spiritual connection to all living things. And so our quantification um, is a desperate move to stop the theft of our water by the states of North Dakota and South Dakota um, in huge amounts. So we um, initiated it in 2013. Um, and so uh, Ocheti Shakoi have ownership of that. No one in the world um, has that. And Britain was defeated when they tried to overcome uh, the United States and indigenous country. They were defeated in the ocean. So um, that's a historic thing that occurred, and we continue to defy them, and the ownership um, lies from the doctrine of discovery. You know, Phyllis, uh, she mentions quantification. That is uh, a, a concept whereby somebody is asking you to say, to say, this is how much water that we need forever. From 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 right now from right now <clears throat> until forever, nobody wants to quantify because we don't want to sell ourselves short. I think, and and also we just don't trust when, when it's the United States or one of the states of that currently occupy our territory, like North Dakota or South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska. Like these these states are illegally occupying the Ocheti Shakoi, the Republic of Lakota, whatever you want to call it. They are here, and, and, and they've never treated for that land. We never, we never gave them permission to be here, and yet they've built up a lot of cities. They've extracted a lot of our resources, and they've put a shelf life. They've put an expiration date on the human species. This is what Western civilization has done or has had a very important role in, because certainly, I don't know if you can consider China... Western civilization, but they're not, nobody is trying to do what indigenous people would do if we were at the helm of the modern nation states. But that, that spirit that compels us to try to create that kind of world, as you can see that it's with us. But if we don't put these, 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 if we don't participate in the matrix in the linear grid property law system that that has been established here in this country known as the united states then we get ignored i've seen it happen in bismarck north dakota when they were declaring to the de declaring certain quantities to be surplus water and they were selling it back to the oil fields so those oil companies could drill could use it for fracking for hydraulic fracturing they didn't ask the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. They didn't ask the Mandan, Hiratsa, Arikara people. They didn't ask the Sioux Nation. They didn't ask anybody. The Army Corps just said, we're going to sell these rights now. I remember being at this Army Corps meeting. And, and that is what's happening right now in South Dakota. They don't care about our treaty rights or the fact that we have a, a priority date that, that predates their rights. If we can't organize and perfect, quote-unquote, perfect our water rights, then they're going to take them. And that's and when we get ignored, things like no DAP will happen. They did, Energy Transfer Partners never came to us and said, look, it, we want to honor the treaty. We seek to build infrastructure in your country, in your homeland. 
how can we make this happen? No, that did not, that, it didn't take place like that. Americans want to act like indigenous peoples are completely erased and that, and we're, we're, like we're no longer here. So I want to just thank Phyllis, as always, for showing up and for the work that you continue to do. Again, Oyate is a documentary that covers some of what Phyllis has done. End of the Line is another very important piece of work, another documentary that received different accolades. And before we transition, um, I just want to turn it back to you, Phyllis, and maybe you have some some closing comments, and, and then we can move on with the evening. I just want to end by um, saying that uh, as Indigenous people, we have we have survived and we have endured and we have we have initiated actions at every level at ground zero for our people we have been partners all over the world um we have um been great strategists we have completed our struggle we are the only people who have defeated the united states military and we don't need to be violent. We do not have to have a collective memory of trauma. We need to go forward being the most beautiful uh, believers in our own technologies. We, we honor the sun, the moon. Uh, we is sun. We is moon. Uh, we uh, is the woman. And um, we honor all of the thunder beings. We are in partnership with them. We're building in partnership with wind, solar, and developing the energies that will be sustainable and conducive to human living. And so the wind of the thunder beings is the female. She is the most contentious. Uh, she listens to no one, to no man. And the linear age of man is over. We are in the age of women divine. We are in the age of Aquarius. We have great powers to continue the birth and living human race. So I, I, Lila Wopila Tanka for Hugashila and for the first gift of water, um, we endure and we continue. Wopila. Thank you for that. Um... If we, uh, I know that we have a, um, we have a matching a donor or maybe a set of donors. Today is Giving Tuesday, so all over the country, I think just the United States, maybe internationally, I don't know. But Giving Tuesday is, is a time for people who want to encourage and empower those in the world of philanthropy with their resources uh, I know that the Lakota People's Law Project has donors, has benefactors that are willing to match every single donation. I'm not sure if that's up to $100,000 or what it is. But we do the Wopila gathering so that our support network, a lot of people who have donated to the Lakota People's Law Project or who have signed up for our emails, and, and who always, you know, let me know either by, by social media or seeing me in person. Yes, I get your emails. That's, and we thank you for that. That is a way that you can stay in touch, that you can stay completely abreast of everything that we're doing, everything that we're trying to do. And Mini Wichoni is, is, is paramount. The, you know, along in the in the 90s, um, we are a spiritual people. And so we take guidance. We seek guidance from the sacred elements, which which compose us, which compose our reality. And we were told in the 90s, I was just a little tiny. I was it was a, a very young person. And I remember the spirits saying, you know, through these intercessors, or what the Western civilization might call shaman or medicine person or whatever. But we were told that, you know, water would, would be sold in a bottle. And we all, we, we just laugh. We laugh because it was unconscionable at the time. 
Like it's unimaginable. We couldn't conceive of people bottling water and then selling it back to you. And then you buying it. Now we pay $10 for a bottle of water at an airport. And we don't even ask a question about that. You know, you got private corporations trying to privatize all of the water on planet Earth. We were also told that, and I don't even like to say this, but that our children would cry for water. So there, these are very serious, you know, work items, if you want to call them that. You know, Mini Wichoni is, is one of those, those pillars. The Indian Child Welfare Act, one of those pillars. Indigenous access to democracy is another one of those pillars. There are more, but those are what we've been able to focus on just in 2021. All right, 2021, 2020 and 2021 and 2022. And, and we are we're going to continue those through 2023. But we can only do that if you help us out if you continue to give us that voice and and we're going to work in partnership with you we have that obligation to people that help us out financially or even in kind there's a lot of ways that you can help lakota law out so i wanted to just say that and then i wanted to turn the microphone over to our good friend anna so she can uh, advise you of of things on her in front of her right now Beautiful. Thank you so much, Chase Iron Eyes. Thank you so much, Phyllis Young. Uh, that was so powerful. It is such an honor to be able to work in support of your work. Thank you both so much for all that you do. Uh, and thank you to you, our viewers, for being here, tuned in to our live stream tonight. Uh, my name is Anna Mason. I have the honor of being the membership program manager for the Lakota People's Law Project. Welcome to our Wopila gathering. Thank you for being here so much with us on our second annual Wopila gathering here on Giving Tuesday. Uh, today is a great day for all of us to join together in support of indigenous sovereignty. If you aren't already watching this live stream from lakotalaw.org slash Wopila, please head over there now. You see it going at the bottom of your screen. That's lakotalaw.org slash Wopila. Uh, there in the bottom right, you can see a little chat icon. Uh, so click that and let us know who you are, where you are tuning in from. Uh, we will pick some comments from that chat and add them up on the screen throughout this event. So do join in on the conversation. We definitely want to hear from you and get to know you. So as I mentioned, this is Lakota Law's second annual Wopila gathering. And we intentionally created this event on Giving Tuesday for a couple of reasons to amplify and celebrate indigenous communities and to expand the capacity of allies and accomplices to exist in solidarity and in support of native people. So this Giving Tuesday, I ask, we ask that you please give from the heart in an effort to uphold our shared mission towards native sovereignty. Uh, there on lakotalaw.org slash wopila, you can see a goal thermometer. Let me check it now and see where we are. So you'll, you'll see that the um, donation goal that we have for today is $20,000. From what I see, we're at 12,580. So we're over halfway there. Uh, please do give from the heart to help us hit that goal by the end of this gathering. And exciting news, as Chase mentioned, and as you see on your screen, Today, all donations will be doubled thanks to a very generous donor. So whatever you give will have twice the impact and will go to support the three areas of work that our Lakota leaders are talking about today. That's pipeline resistance and protection of sacred lands and waters, Indian child welfare, and the native vote. Now there are three ways, three key ways that you can give today there on that page, lakotalaw.org slash wopila. One is by donating with a doubled donation. The other is becoming a member or starting a fundraiser. So there to the right of the live stream, you are able to donate. You're able to become a member with a recurring monthly gift of $5 or more. And if you scroll down the page, you'll see a button there to start a fundraiser. Again, any gift will be doubled today. So please do dig deep and give from the heart. And if you're enjoying this event, and we hope you are, then consider joining our membership circle with a recurring monthly donation of $5 or more. Uh, we would not be here able to host this gathering and making a real difference in Lakota communities without the consistent support of members. 
uh, Lakota Law members form a special community that has special access to more conversations and interactions like this uh, with our Lakota organizers and leaders. So if you're able to commit ongoing support, please do so there at lakotalaw.org slash by clicking become a member. So thank you again for making the choice to be here. Please give what you can as we stand together in solidarity for Indigenous justice. We so look forward to sharing the rest of today's program with you. Um, if we could put a slide up on the screen that shows ways that supporters can take action uh, when it comes to the topic that we just heard about, Water is Life. Um, there you are, so you can donate there. Um, if you visit our Action Center, take a screenshot. Um, there's a petition there that you can sign. There's some blog posts where you can dive a little bit deeper into the topics we just heard about. And there's that donate link. So thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna transition into the next phase of our program, which is Indian Child Welfare. Thank you, much love. My name is Madonna Thunderhawk. I'm from South Dakota. I am working specifically with tribal governments on child welfare issues concerning South Dakota Department of Social Services. We, as an organization, realized that we were dealing with a lot of grandparents because in the Lakota, Dakota way, uh, everybody's involved with raising children. So uh, a lot of these children that were being taken by the Department of Social Services in South Dakota, uh, a lot of them were being taken from grandparents, specifically grand grandmothers. Part of uh, the ICWA law is a kinship placement. Active efforts to place children in kinship situations wasn't happening. And that state of South Dakota is totally ignoring ICWA. Grandparents, elders in our society, they, it's automatic, they have standing. They have status, okay? It's just dealing with the outside, outside of our, our realm of, you know, native thinking that it's it's the opposite. But of course, we don't have the resources. It's, it, it's fine to say all that and it's all there, but we're talking statewide here. You know, the state of South Dakota and the reservations are scattered all over the state. And it's a rural state. So it was just kind of a natural progression of how we were going to uh, fight this whole issue, this ongoing issue of child theft in our communities. It's always a, not so much focusing on, oh my God, this is happening, as like, what can we do? How can, how can we fight this? You know, the struggle is continual. Our people, from one generation to another, have never had any uh, time to recover from federal Indian policies. So it's almost like an intergenerational uh, coping mechanism to just struggle and hang on. Wow. Uh, that's the first time I saw that video. Uh, thank you for that. That looks like... Uh... That was in the in a California. Uh, it's probably very very nice out there right now, and you know, I, just from that video, the Brackeen case, uh, and, and Danny Sheehan will give an update about that in in a little bit. But the Supreme Court of the United States, which has done other things as well, like overturn Roe versus Wade, like push back on the McGirt case which recognized Indian country in Oklahoma. Um, they're doing very strange things right now, and they've chosen to consider this ICWA case, Brackeen versus Holland, so that, you know, it could have very serious implications for tribal sovereignty, for indigenous sovereignty. I remember when I started at Lakota Law, I remember Madonna, and I remember Phyllis, and I was in the in-house attorney's office at the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And I remember Madonna and Phyllis coming to my office on many occasions trying to tell me what was happening in South Dakota. The systemic nature of equal violations by these settler states. 
South Dakota happens to be one of them. Whether you're on the blue team, the red team, the green team, the libertarian team, it doesn't matter politically. These guys are illegally occupying our country and they're taking our children. Now, you can fight in courts. And when we've done that, you know, we've filed an amicus brief in Brackeen. We've done whatever we can do ever since. Even, Madonna's been doing this since before I got to the team here in 2012. Another thing that we've done is hustle for dollars from the federal government. You know, we've got the Oglala Sioux Tribe and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe Three hundred thousand dollars before in the you know over the last ten years we're trying to build capacity. I want to turn the mic over to Madonna and Decora because you guys have been building capacity on Cheyenne River at, at least on Cheyenne River probably other places too. But I'm just going to turn the microphone over to you guys and you guys say what you need to say. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, it's really good to be here. Um, I'm just hoping that um, I can. We didn't, the sound was kind of bad for us on this end, you know, uh, for the the opening uh, trailer. So I don't know. I don't want to repeat, you know, what, what the uh, video just said that I said. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be here and. Uh, I wanted to kind of bring up a, a little bit of the history of, of this struggle that we're in right now for ICWA. It, uh, because I remember when the law was passed, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, back in the day, you know, and it was a fight. It was a struggle because most of the Western states that have uh, large Indian populations and reservations were uh, fighting it tooth and nail. And Senator Aberesk at the time uh, from South Dakota initiated the uh, the uh, ICWA. And uh, so it was a, a major fight to get it passed. And um, so it's, it's been in place since then, but it's, uh, it's been difficult because we're dealing with states you assume that uh, while well, ICWA you know, is the law, the federal law and, and, the, and everyone should abide by it. Well, not in South Dakota anyway, <laughs> many of the, uh, counties, the courts in the, in the local counties that surround reservations, they just totally choose to ignore ICWA. And because the tribes do not, the tribal governments do not have the resources to fight each and every individual case, a lot of times ICWA is ignored. So there's a constant, constant battle on family by family, you know, and usually grandmothers that are raising grandchildren. So it's a major um, fight that's still going on. And then here we have on the, on the uh, you know, the national level, we have the, uh, um, the court, the Supreme Court case where they're actually trying to get rid of ICOI, you know, and it just seems like it's a constant battle. But of course, you do what you got to do. You stay in it. You know, it's for the children. And so, of course, that's our future. We have to just, you know, take on every struggle that comes along. Uh, but uh, like Chase said, on Shine River, we've been, we've been just working as a, well, our grandmother's group, which we formed, you know. Um, it's the Wash Agianaji. That means standing strong. A grandmother's group. And it's mostly grandmothers. We all got together because... Uh, uh, most grandmothers are raising grandchildren. We have the the OGs, which are the old grandmothers, and the YGs, the young grandmothers. The young grandmothers are usually working and raising grandchildren. So the OGs, that's me, I'm one of them. Uh, we have the freedom to go to meetings. We have the freedom to uh, move around the reservation and, and, and you know handle issues relating to to uh, child welfare. So we decided that, you know, we don't want to be complaining and, you know, uh, we just feel like it's, a, it's our responsibility to do something. So we got organized and we're working with our tribal council and we, um, you know, are, are working in, 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 in an effort to eventually establish our own child welfare uh, 
on our reservation, preferably a family restoration program, pro program that will be um, comprehensive with wraparound services for children. I mean, that's what we're hoping to do. Mm -hmm. But what we did do um, this past uh, spring and summer was we held some um, hearings and uh, Decora helped us a lot with that. I mean, we she's been working with us along with, with doing, because she has a, a background in, in uh, American Indian law, it was so helpful for us to get organized to do this. So maybe you could explain that a little bit, Decora. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you this evening on Giving Tuesday. Um, as my grandmother said, you know, we wanted to um, hold hearings this past summer um, in each community on Cheyenne River just to kind of gauge the situation that our people situations that our people are facing when it comes to um, raising their grandchildren or even, you know, parents attended as well. But um, we just kind of wanted to develop like an idea of what we were looking at, what we were trying to, uh, yes, combat, you know, in these types of situations. And so we went and we set up in each community. We had several hearings where we were collecting information from families on their um, experiences. And so collecting this information was really important so that we can kind of consolidate it into a report that we could share with um, our tribal council members. These are situations that they may or may not have been aware of, but um, it was really important for us to kind of just have something um, solid that we can present. And, you know, a lot of it was like issues of miscommunication between different departments or, um, even individuals facing, um, I guess, state standards that don't really equate to traditional and cultural um, lifestyles. And so just kind of like getting that together and um, making sure that we were making our representatives aware of what's happening with our grandparents and their children, their grandchildren. Um, so we, we did that and we put together a really awesome report and shared it with tribal council members and um, it received unanimous support. So that was one of the successes that I wanted to mention while we're here, but it was um, something that I was pretty proud of what about you. Oh yeah. It was good because it's, it, well, it's the modern day, you know, anytime you're going to do anything, especially with, um, whether, you know, whatever government is a tribal, state, you know, federal, uh, you got to have data, you know, it's got to be study based and all that kind of stuff. So uh, thanks to our young people where we work with, you know, and especially with legal background, you know, we're able to step up and do those types of things. And our tribal council uh, members there, they were so thankful that we did, you know, they basically mm -hmm. said you did the work, you know, and so they're supporting us 100%. We have a, a committee going now with some of our, our YGs that are working with council members. And some of these tribal council members also dealt with the struggle to over their grandchildren so, um, mm -hmm. or their children. So, it, you know, it, they volunteer to work with us. So we have a, a, a committee that's working right now together um, to... Uh, put together the um, short term because we got to do something that the children are still going off the reservation. So for the short term is to, to beef up some of these programs that are supposed to be handling, you know, saving the children, but also to give more support to the ICWA office, our ICWA program here on Shine River. Um, so that's what the, our short term, short range um, it, uh, issues are. Uh, but the long range, of course, is is where we can get um, um, and eventually get a uh, family restoration project going for our reservation. So that that's the the uh, main main. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh... Uh, Decora and Madonna are, are uh, making major headway. It's not easy to make headway 
in our tribal nations. And I, I don't, you know, I've been at this for, for 14 years, leaving a window open for the Standing Rock Nation, leaving a window open for the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe or, you know, the, the four bands, the people of the four bands. I used to work for that in-house attorney's office there, leaving a window open for the Oglala Sioux Tribe. We 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 we've tried to do the best that we can to be nimble on our feet and just be adaptive because as Madonna was saying, the 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 chaos that comes from a foreigner imposing strife and and unbearable unbearable backbreaking poverty forced dependency that's what modern indian reservations are i hear some people scholars some even native say that the the indian reservation is an example of failed socialism the indian reservation is not socialism the indian reservation is forced dependency all the way back before europeans got here during the time of the Doctrine of Discovery, a system was devised to capture us. By then, the indigenous peoples of Europe were already captured. They were already being illegally occupied. Their hearts, spirits, and minds being extracted, being abstracted from them. You know, people who identify as white, who call themselves white people, and I mentioned that because I mentioned Europe. If you go back far enough, you too come from a people that were strong in medicine, strong in natural elemental knowledge systems. This just means you paid attention. Natural scientists, natural philosophers. That's what we are. But we are being held in a state of captivity where we can't focus. It is so tough. It's a struggle. And we're doing what we can to deconstruct that and, and, and to pick at it here and there. There's many other indigenous nonprofits that are also doing that work. And this is Giving Tuesday. So where if you find yourself spending your evening with us, we want to thank you. We, we also try to share the energy, share the love, share the power. Just get it out there. There's so much work for us to do. And Decora and Madonna are doing that legwork on Cheyenne River. We've begun to do that leg, pick the legwork back up on Standing Rock. But the statistics are abhorrent. They, they are, they, they shock the conscience. How many Native children are being taken out of Indian homes, Indian families, and put in non-Indian homes and institutions? It, the la 10 years ago, it was 740 a year. I don't know what that number is now. Like, we've been working on it that long. And every month, probably every week, every day, on a cyclical nature, our children bec are, are being taken from Indian families, from families which would uphold indigenous identity. That's what the Indian Child Welfare Act was designed to do that's why it's so important that's why who you know the gibson dunn law firm it, it go to, go on to our website go to go to lakotalaw.org and and to view the stream we want you to view the stream there too but after this stream go there to learn about what is happening in the brackeen case before the supreme court right now we stood up at standing rock and let the world know that we're still here we're powerful. In fact, we're probably humanity's last hope for salvation <laughs> and for deliverance from the, the, the prison that the colonizer has built. It's very real. I mean, you think of think of our what, what we see in the media today in Wakanda or Black Panther 1 and 2 and, and uh, what's the other one? Avatar. They, they won't let us play the main characters and, and create our own media, but they'll mythologize us and act like we're not here. But we're in this struggle with you. We've been paying attention for 500 years and longer. 
And so when we say that our children are being stolen, that the state is taking them in violation of federal law, they're completely ignoring it. That's not the only federal law that they're ignoring. They're, right now, they're ignoring the National Voter Registration Act. We had to sue the state of South Dakota for that. But we could sue people or we can help build capacity. We try to do that at Standing Rock. We try to do that at Pine Ridge. And Madonna and Decor are not doing it at Shine River. I just want to say, you know, the statistics are bad. It's, it's, it's that we're 10 to 12 percent of the entire population of South Dakota. 54 percent of all children in Department of Social Services custody are native children. And Madonna has been here since the beginning. She started this gangsta ish. You know, she talks about being the OG, the old grandma. Russell Means was also involved in that, that beginning impetus, that beginning force that caused the Lakota People's Law Project to come into existence. So, Madonna, I want to turn it back to you. And, and if you could just talk about you know, what that was like. I, I, I wasn't there when it formed. And so if you could just talk about how those forces came together to, to compel this work, uh, we would appreciate that. Yeah, okay, a little bit more history, I guess, yeah. Well, you know, it, I got, basically it was pretty simple. I got a call uh, one day, and this was way back, I don't know, 2006, I think. Uh, and it was my brother, Russell Means, and he said, uh, all right, I'm gonna give you a number now. You gotta call this attorney right away. You know, you need to talk to him, you gotta call him right away. So I said, oh, okay, all right. So that's what I did. And it happened to be Danny Sheehan. And he explained to me uh, what they were going to do. They were, were uh, initially they were doing a project with one of our council members, Bryce Innerwoods. They were doing a project on land. I don't know if it was land restoration or what it was. Anyway, the issue was, but there happened to be uh, several... Um, <clears throat> grandparents that, that came to the meeting to work on the land issue. But they also, when they found out that Danny Sheehan was an actual attorney, which are very rare in, out here, um, they, um, they told him all about how they were, they couldn't, their grandchildren were taken from them. And that the state of South Dakota, which still does to a certain extent, but um, they, they will only deal with the parent. So they say, well, the grandparents don't have any legal standing mm -hmm. in the, the court system, you know, in the state, the state court system. So whether the grandchildren were raising these children from the time they were infants, it didn't matter to the state. They just take them. So that's where the issue started. And so, um, yeah, Dan, Dan Sheehan was telling me on the phone, he said, we're looking for a community organizer to help us work on the whole issue of, um, you know, what's happening with ICWA, how strong ICWA is in Indian country, and if not, why? And, you know, that kind of work, how we could, what we can do to help because of what's happening with grandparents. So that's how it all started. And I thought, yeah, well, this, absolutely, you know, because that's what I, I was working on just, you know, on my own, you know, just doing, doing what I could when people would call, you know, I try to do what I could, but so I thought, well, this is really great. And here's an organization um, that has resources that is willing to help. And they're not, they're at, they, that's what I liked about Lakota People's Law Project. They are community driven. They're Lakota community driven because that's why I got involved because they asked my advice. They said, we're, we're here, we're here to help, but this is, you know what you're doing out there. That's, that's your people, that's your, man. help yeah. us, what, you know, basically tell us what to do. You know, how, we, how do we do this? We want to help. So that's how it all started. And, oh, man, it was awesome when we got going. You know, we just did wonderful things. One of the main things that happened for me, and it was in 2011, LPLP, Danny Sheehan's contacts, he got, we got uh, National Public Radio to come out here. And they did an expose on, on uh, 
Well, it was the National Public uh, Broadcasting did a uh, expose on South Dakota and their the violations of ICWA and how they were, um, you know, creating uh, legal orphans of our of our people, our children, and uh, it was amazing. So South Dakota immediately started backpedaling, you know, and they were just trying to beef up their image and and try to work more with ICWA, but still it's all, it all boils down to the dollar, you know? Uh, there's a price on every one of our children. When any native child goes into the South Dakota's DSS system, they are immediately labeled uh, special needs. So they get fed more federal dollars for them, for each child. So again, it's all about money. So wow. the fight, the struggle is still on. Um. You know, thank you for that, Decora. Um, I definitely wanted to. I know that you guys don't know exactly what has been uh, done on Shine River, but I know that the grandmothers group, um, Washagi Anaji, and uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, intergovernmental work that is happening there. Um, if you could talk about, you know, if you might have left something out there, uh, uh, particularly I'm thinking about the Navajo Nation has just elected a new president. We want to say congratulations to Boo Nigren. I'm not quite sure if, if that's how you pronounce this brother's name, but we Boo Nigren is, is uh, I followed the Navajo Nation's uh, elections. And I just wanted to send my congratulations to to Boo Nigren. I know that in the recent, very recent um, past, we've tried to work with Port Gamble Sklalem because the way that tribal governments operate dollars from from Title IV from the federal government can help out a lot. When Madonna is talking about Indian children being worth a lot of money. To the state of South Dakota, their Indian children are probably worth more than a hundred million dollars. You know, eighty million dollars every single year just in federal for e or for Title IV reimbursements. I'm not sure if it's it's subsection E, but there's there's many subsections of Title IV. I mean, I, we're going into the weeds here, but they're they're taking kids because there's a financial interest in it, and I just most recently learned about that. So I want to I want to encourage and and let the people know that it's because you're helping us that Madonna and Decora are able to do their work on the ground, and I'm glad that Madonna took that call, because when you're a visible indigenous person, a visible native, you get a lot of calls. Like I get a lot of calls. I've probably done no less than you know a few hundred interviews. Like I just lost track, and you never know when it's always some person from the outside that you think might have resources, you might think have good intentions. We get a lot of calls. I'm glad Madonna took that call and she linked with Danny Sheehan because we have been able to evolve. We've been able to survive as an organization since then. So I, I want to give it back to Decora as we close up the ICWA session because I'm also glad that Decora has joined the team. And, and I want to give her uh, the space to kind of close us out. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, now that we have a solid relationship with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribal Council, um, we were able to acquire a, an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with the tribe that has given us the authority to continue the work on um, this tribally operated uh, child welfare department. And anything that kind of just goes into it, you know, there we have their ear. Um, so the next piece, you know, you mentioned Navajo Nation is, you know, we want to kind of extend our reach now to um, nations that already have their own tribally operated child welfare departments. And so now we're going to try and facilitate a relationship with Navajo Nation so that we can kind of see what our next steps are, how things are operating, and um, kind of just take that information and bring it back to our homelands. So I just kind of wanted to share a little bit of that um, next steps with you, with everyone on this call. Um, 
but um you know it's really important work that we're doing and i was just talking to my unchi you know uh i was young when she started this work um around our you know indigenous children our lakota children and it's almost feels like this torch is starting to like pass you know and it's i'm really fortunate to be able to do this work with my grandmother my mentor i love her so much um so it's it's just really impactful. It's really powerful, and this work needs to continue. Aho, Wopi Latranka, Madonna. Do you have any words? I don't want to close on. Uh, just we gotta always gotta give it up to the elder. Well, I'm just I'm just uh, excited, <laughs> you know, because this is it's, it's a chance to just let our supporters and people that know us, you know. Uh, we get to, you know, talk to them, let them know what we're doing, and actually that it's for real what we're doing, you know. And the and the work is, uh, it's hard, you know, it's it's taxing, but it's it's gratifying, you know. And uh, and for the support of all the uh, people out there, that just you know makes makes it possible, you know. You just it's just an awesome thing that's going on. So I want to thank everyone for for you, you know, for tuning in to us and listening, and we appreciate you and. Especially, I know there's some uh, thousand grandmothers out there from Oakland. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, well, uh, we will. Thank you. <laughs> hey, um, we let's design another stream. Um, there's, like I said, we got depth, so we could certainly explore. But for now, the Iqua session. We're gonna close the Iqua session, and we're gonna remind people who are joining us or who've been who've been watching the stream. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, whether on, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, wherever you might be joining from, we're urging you to go to lakotalaw.org backslash Wopila. Please watch from the site. It's it's a better experience there. And we're also, we, I want to remind you that we have a matching donation going on right now. One of our donors has agreed to match everything that we raise right now. So I did not know that our goal was $20,000. Earlier, I said 100K. I mean, that sounds like a lot. To me, that's a lot of money, but that's not a lot of money organizationally. You know, we're, we're grateful for people who become members at $5 a month. I mean, it's more than $5 to go into a coffee shop and get a coffee shop right now. So we, when we know that people are struggling, we know that inflation is what it is. And we, we also know that the working class is completely exploited. In this country. And so we appreciate every single thing that you give. Now, we also told you before that there is a lawsuit with, uh, 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 upon which oral argument was heard in the Supreme Court of the United States November 9th of, 20, of this year. So a few, like less than a month ago, you know, our our group, our Lakota People's Law Project, filed an amicus brief in the Brackeen lawsuit. I mean, this this suit is a declaration of war by people who want to dismantle indigenous sovereignty. And and I want to let me just talk about Danny for a for a hot thirty seconds, and then we can bring Danny Sheehan on. But Danny Sheehan, I don't re really remember when I met Danny back in the day, but uh, it wasn't until I read the People's Advocate which is his book in autobiography, a, a legal, you know, a history of what he's done with his law career. And, and he's a constitutional litigator. He, he's been there through some of the big cases. And the things that I studied in law school, Danny Sheehan was part of those cases, some of them. And I jokingly kind of, I called him the Forrest Gump of lawyers because he just seems to be everywhere. But he he is going to provide us with an update on the Brackeen versus Holland ICWA case that is before the United States Supreme Court right now. So I just with no with no further ado, I want to turn it over to Mr. Sheehan. Oh, terrific. Great you guys. I'm putting up my little my little uh, clock so that I won't go over time here. But look, the 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 simple bottom line on this is that the the major industrial forces of mining and oil uh, and uh, in alternative energy sources now are are basically attempting to sweep onto the land of the native people and take over their land to be able to drill for oil there 
search for gold there, search for silver there. Uh, and they want to now eventually put up wind generators on their property. Uh, and what they're trying to do is drive the children uh, off the reservation so that they can basically dissipate the entire tribes. These things, this began back, you know, uh, it, when gold was discovered in 1849 and the Europeans from the East Coast swept across the prairies going out to California and they discovered that there was all this land in the middle of the country. Uh, and so that when the American Civil War ended in 1865, they swept in and started trying to take over the land. They, they wanted to do gold mining and, and oil drilling and all the things they wanted to do. And they decided they had to get rid of the, the tribes. And so they decided they were going to set up these, these boarding schools and take all the children away. We all know about this. They took all the children away and, and put them into these boarding schools and cut their hair off and, and refused to allow them to speak their language and took them away from their families and tribes. And, and that, went on, that went on all during the 1870s into the 1880s, all the way up into the 20th century. Uh, and the horrors of that are still being uh, are resonating around the country about the graves that they found of the children who died there, you know, under abuse. And the fact of the matter is that that we got contacted uh, back after George Bush Jr. got elected in 2000 uh, and came into office in 2001. And what happened out in Dakota Territory is this this epidemic began again, even though they'd shut down the boarding schools and stop them from taking the children forcibly away from the tribes. And what happened is a, a basic epidemic began to uh, occur again. Of over, As Chase was mentioning, over 742 Lakota children every single year, just from the state of South Dakota, similar numbers out of North Dakota. And they were all being taken, and over half of them never appeared again. Uh, and the, the, it turns out that we were contacted and asked to, because I had been involved back at the occupation of Wounded Knee working with the American Civil Liberties Union back in 1973, I got contacted and asked if I would go out and try to figure out what was going on here. So, of course, I called Madonna Thunderhawk, whom I'd known back from the occupation during the American Indian Movement days, uh, to figure out what's happening here. And what we discovered, what we discovered is that they're, that they were completely ignoring the Indian Child Welfare Act that required before any Indian child could be taken away from uh, her or his parents, uh, it had to be given to their grandparents or their other relatives. There had to be preferential placement of the, of the children with their, with their relatives before they could even conceive of uh, putting them into white foster care or into a white adoption uh, families. And yet the state of South Dakota, North Dakota, and others, Texas and others, were just completely ignoring this. And so we were asked to come in to help to figure out how to do this. And so we went in, we brought in National Public Radio and others to show what the evidence was that we had, we had uncovered in working with the, with the indigenous people locally, uh, with Phyllis and Madonna and, and the other people, the grandmothers. And what we did is we brought in National Public Radio. They exposed this. So we got the Justice Department to come out to, to South Dakota. And when, when Obama got elected, uh, Obama had the head of the Civil Rights Division contact us at the Lakota People's Law Project that we had set up out there and to ask us to draft a whole series of guidelines to actually enforce the Indian Child Welfare Act and the preferential placement uh, requirements of that. And that's what triggered this lawsuit uh, down in Texas. And this hardcore right-wing Judge O'Connor uh, who's the go-to guy for all the right wing down there, you know, uh, declared the Indian Child Welfare Act to be unconstitutional because the requirement that a child, an Indian child taken from the child's family uh, had to be placed with the Native American family, they asserted that it was racial discrimination against white people. <laughs> and so the, 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 we, this was preposterous. You know, the, the, the Indian tribes are a political entity has been recognized by the United States government and there are treaty rights that the people have to be, to be protected against this exploitation. And so that's what's happened here. And so we, we've been asked and we wrote uh, major briefs to the United States Supreme Court challenging this uh, assertion that this was racial prejudice. This is a political uh, decision made by the United States government, the federal government. And we made a, a, a principled argument that the Article I of the United States Constitution places plenipotentiary power in the hands of the federal government to make decisions as to what they're the best interests of an Indian child. 
if they're taken away from their parents. And that the federal government has the authority under Article I to, to rule on all of the issues de dealing with um, Indian affairs. It's perfectly obvious uh, that this is a, a bogus uh, argument that's being made. And it's extraordinarily important to highlight what Chase pointed out to you. The lawyers, that are the law firm that has filed this lawsuit against the Indian Child Welfare Act to try to be able to allow the taking of the children away from the reservations is, is Gibson Dunn and Crutcher. Gibson Dunn and Crutcher is the law firm for the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Energy Transfer Partners, the people who are trying to come in and take the water and take drill drill through their fields and to pump their oil through the through the reservations. This is this is the law firm that is just gratuitously offered to do this for free. You know, tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal work they're just offering to do to try to destroy the Indian Child Welfare Act. The reason that the Lakota People's Law Project is so deeply involved in this is because the Lakota people have been such a victim of, of the violation of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So we, have, we are, are helping to do this. The, the people have risen up. They've stood not only in the face of the pipeline, but they've stood in the face of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, this major multi-million dollar a year law firm uh, that is working not only for the oil corporations to try to get the children off the reservation and dissipate the tribes so they can go in and take their land away, but they're also representing the interests of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys. The American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, all white bunch of lawyers, are getting up to $100,000 for every single Indian child that they can take away from their reservation and adopt out to wealthy white families. You know, this is, this is what's going on here. Uh, and the, the United States Supreme Court has heard our oral arguments now. Uh, the, the, the arguments are in. I believe that we're going to be able to get a Judge uh, Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch, to support uh, our position. And I think Justice Roberts is going to support our position. So I think that we're going to win this decision five to four, uh, but they're going to hold off until June, almost certainly, uh, of, of next year before they enter the judgment uh, because they want to bring this out with all of their other affirmative action cases. They're going to be ruling against affirmative action in colleges. They're going to be ruling against affirmative action on behalf of black people and, uh, and other minority groups. And they're going to try to hold this up to say, oh, well, look, with regard to Native American people, we're going to give them a special uh, authorization to be protected uh, against these kind of statutes. So, so this is what's happening. This is the, the case of, of uh, Brackeen versus uh, Holland. It's in the United States Supreme Court. And uh, the, all, of our, all of our people have been involved in working with the, the Native American Rights Fund uh, and others, uh, ACLU and all kinds of people across the country have all rallied now behind the Lakota people and others to stand in the face of this effort to get rid of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And uh, we represent uh, the uh, uh, Senator Aberesk, who is the actual author of the statute. He is the chair of the advisory board for our Lakota People's Law Project that we're asking you to help out here. These are the kind of things that we're able to do with your support. Uh, without your support, uh, nothing can be done. And so we've come here on this special day to ask you for your help, you know, to send your contributions into the Romero Institute to enable us to provide the kind of administrative assistance that everybody needs out there, kind of the, the covering their costs for traveling around in meetings and going to all the places. Uh, and, and, you know, reasonable salaries for the people to do this kind of work. That's what we're asking for on, on this special Tuesday. Uh, and so that's my, that's all the time I get. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Danny. You know what? Um, that is all the time you get, my man. Like I, I could listen to you go on uh, for hours and I have actually. Um, what's happening in the Supreme Court is dangerous. We, you know, it's not even just with with native people. It's it's Roe versus Wade. Look what they did to more than half of the American population, and people turned out to vote this election, and and were very encouraged that. But in my view, now I, I have a, a junior view with with respect to people who've been in this practice for a long time. But what, what I can, can see is that the court, you know, America is changing. The demographics are changing. And people uh, are using fear, confusion, 
doubt of of the other and for the longest time that other has been anyone that wasn't a, a hetero european christian male and so people are are kind of shrinking back and realizing that that is not the the dominant demographic like yes those were the founding fathers that's who designed all the institutions that oppress the other but the people in that court are certainly feeling that pressure and not only that but a certain president stuck that court with uh people who i might say are are on the fringe or or certainly stand you know indigenous law or indigenous sovereignty so these court cases are extremely important i want to thank danny and i also want to thank lanny sinking you know there's a there's a volcano erupting where he's at right now in in hawaii in the kingdom of hawaii i want to thank uh dove I know that Brother Dove was involved. These are just par- part of our staff members, people who we can afford to hire because you give us that power. You share your time and, and, and your energy. And I know that's important. These are like, you know, an annual report to our constituents. This is, we we want to tell you what we're doing, what we've been empowered to do because you're willing to help us. And I know that we've got to bring on Sarah Nelson, the executive director of Romero Institute and La Cota Law. She's she's been uh, making sure all the the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted for time now, and I, and I really appreciate that. But and I just I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Sarah. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks to everyone who is here, all of the teams and and also all of the people who have come because this is a very important day. Giving Tuesday is a real opportunity for people who are on the front lines doing justice work to communicate with our supporters and and people who are are standing with us in these fights. And um, I wanna just say a few more things about ICWA uh, to clarify, just just a little bit of clarification. The Romero Institute's mission is to expose and identify and uncover and investigate systemic injustice that affects hundreds and thousands and sometimes millions of people. And systemic means it's stuck in the system. And so it just keeps happening. And our goal is always not only to expose it, investigate it, uncover it, but also find a solution that could shift it so that it didn't keep happening. So what we realized in in the 16 or so years of work uh, with Lakota folks in, in the Dakotas is that the injustice of, and we were originally asked to come and look at this, the injustice of taking children, and they call it the terrible taking, just like Thanksgiving is the Thanks taking. The terrible taking of children, when you rip a child out of a grandparent's heart or out of a parent's heart and they may never see them again, you do permanent damage to the grandparents, the parents, and to the child. And we've interviewed all kinds of people that have testified to this effect. So and it's still going on, even though the even though the ACLU won a case showing that the state of South Dakota is is violating ICWA every day, taking these kids and not allowing the parents or the grandparents to even be able to defend themselves, to have any due process at all. So even though that case was won, the right wing leadership of that state does not enforce what happened in that case. And so it just goes on and on. But I but here's the, the moment of truth. Now you have the adoption attorneys and now you have the extraction industries with fossil fuels and uranium and what have you joining with the states which are making money taking these kids and you have all of them trying to overturn ICWA and what would that mean? That would mean it would be just a field day of going after these kids and it would you can't have a future for tribes if you don't have children. Children are the future of the tribes. And you can't have sovereignty 
and without the kids and without the tribes. And these are really important things. So what is the solution? We feel that we know what it is based on all the work we've done so far. And that is for the federal government to pay every month to tribes to have their own child and welfare programs that they administer and that they design the guidelines for rather than giving it to the states. That's the shift that needs to occur and it's happening. It's, it's happening in, in the state of Washington with the Port Gamble tribe. It's now happening with the Navajo tribe, which is very big. It's happening with a couple small tribes in Minnesota. It's happening. This shift is occurring. It has not yet occurred in Lakota country, but we, if you give today to this work that Madonna and Decora and Phyllis, who's always been concerned about this, are doing to protect the children and the future of the tribes, you will be making it possible for them to go visit the Navajo and find out what did you do? How did you do it? What are all the steps? How long does it take? What do you know? And the same thing in Minnesota, because it takes resources to do this kind of research and to pull, pull together what the plan has to be in order to get to the goal. So anyway, uh, thank you very much. I hope you will help with this. It means so much to the hearts of the Lakota families. Thank you. All righty. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, it is important. I mean, it, we're, uh, I, I enjoy speaking about what we've done, what we've been able to do. And we have a responsibility to, to carry out, you know, the, the reasons why we were formed in the first place and, and the things that we've been able to do to defend indigenous sovereignty and that, that that's a that's a pretty broad scope of work there but because you're able to help us we're able to do what needs to be done i do want to bring on my co director at lakota law mr danny paul nelson he's been you know with me on in, in north dakota and on standing rock in south dakota on pine ridge in rapid city to do what we have to to make sure that we're voting. This year, we launched a, a, a project called o Ocheti Vote, and we held an event in Rapid City, South Dakota, at the Skill Center. And we 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 settled on this. We ended up with the Skill Center because Danny Paul had called a lot of places and, and found out that you know we weren't we weren't welcome in certain venues for whatever reason. Um, but we've, you know, we, we're always trying to fight for and, and try to strengthen indigenous sovereignty. It doesn't matter. The political labels don't matter, I mean, whether it's, it's uh, you know, communist capitalists or, or, or re red Republicans or blue Democrats or the Green Party or the Libertarians or the independents. I mean, none of that matters to me personally. Those are vehicles. Those are those are places that are that are useful to the strengthening of indigenous nationhood. That that is what I'm about. That's what our organization is about. Is making sure that we can continue to 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 live on and to to deconstruct and and de shackle. You know, we we want to we want to feel our chains and we want to take them off. We want to throw the yoke of Western civilization that, that is current that is currently burdening us in in myriad ways so but i, I do want to talk about our our voting work our efforts to increase the ocheti vote and the ocheti is a word that describes what in sometimes called the sioux nation so for that i want to invite danny paul on and 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 maybe uh you know i just like you to to ask you to start you know, where did you get involved with voting work in Indian country? And and where do you, you know, where have you seen it evolve since maybe start uh, just uh, 2018 comes to mind because we did really, really good work there on Standing Rock. And that was right on the heels of DAPL. And, and uh, it continued in, and in 2022. So, Danny Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Chase, thanks so much, partner. Uh, what a privilege it is to work with you as well as Phyllis and Madonna and Decora. 
and all of the, the staff that we have uh, in the Dakotas. I, as Chase mentioned, I spent a lot of my time on the ground uh, at Standing Rock, at Cheyenne River, at Pine Ridge, uh, wherever I'm needed. Um, but it has afforded me the opportunity to be very involved in three different vote campaigns that we've done over the past three election cycles. They, these campaigns have been life-changing. They have been profound. Uh, they have been impactful. Uh, all three have involved partnership with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe of one variety or another. So we have a lot to celebrate in terms of the intimacy that we've been able to cultivate with various tribal leaders and tribal members at Standing Rock since 2018. Uh, I know that, that uh, we've got video content to show to you about some of these campaigns. I will expect uh, control just to kind of put those up as soon as they're ready, but I will speak until, until they do. Uh, just mentioned that in 2018, you know, may, many of you may have been tuned in to the national political climate at that time. The, sen the Senate hung in the balance. Uh, it was evenly split. Uh, it was going to come down to who was elected uh, Senate in North Dakota. Uh, Heidi Heitkamp, a Democrat, had, had won prior to that uh, in 2012. Uh, and so she was coming up for re-election, and it was very tight. And, you know, as a nonpartisan organization, we don't support candidates or parties, but we are alert to uh, the, the need to amplify the impact of the Native vote, right? So wherever it is that Native people can help to determine outcomes of elections, uh, we go if we can. And so we did show up for that campaign at Standing Rock to make sure that uh, people on the North Dakota side of the res uh, were empowered and that the franchise was respected for them. And it was a tough year because there was a, a what we consider to be a voter suppression law passed by the state of North Dakota within two weeks of the election. So about two weeks prior to, uh, to, the, to election day, a voter ID law gets passed by the extremely conservative uh, legislature in, South, in North Dakota uh, requiring IDs uh, that have street addresses on them, which is something that is, is known to discriminate against Native communities where many households actually don't have street addresses at all. Um, also just ID requirements in general. It's a tool that's used throughout the United States to suppress the votes of, of people of color, of poor people, people who have less administrative capacity. Um, and I just wanna mention that, you know, one of the principles that animates the work that we do is that everyone should be able to vote as easily as possible. That is, that is the democratic principle uh, that this organization fights for across the board. Um, whether a person uh, has been in prison, whether a person has a perfect ID, all these things should only come into play to the extent that there's evidence to support the notion that they actually lead to fraud. This is one of the, the fake arguments made by um, people who have desired to suppress the votes of the kinds of communities that we work within. They come up with arguments that really have no bearing on reality. They're not grounded in evidence. There's very, very little evidence actually to support the notion that voter fraud takes place anywhere in this country, uh, certainly by community of color, poor people, there's really no evidence. So we have to be on alert for fake arguments. Uh, we have seen um, fascistic movements throughout the history of uh, the entire globe, really, in which these kinds of fatuous uh, claims have been made as excuses for depriving people of their rights to be represented. And so 2018 for us at Standing Rock was an example of that. And so we sprang into action we collaborated with other nonprofits. We worked directly with the tribe itself to push back. And it was a very interesting experience. Every media entity in the country came to Standing Rock. You know, we were Phyllis Young, who you saw earlier tonight, was on ABC Nightline. The New York Times was present. The Washington Post was there. CNN, MSNBC, everybody was there. I think Rachel Maddow actually retweeted one of our press releases that we did. So it was one of those moments where the entire world was focused on the work that you're doing. And that's a, that's a privilege to find yourself in a, in a position like that of influence. And I'm proud to say that we took maximum advantage of that moment. We, we worked collaboratively with everybody who was involved in that, that effort to push back against that voter suppression law. And I think we achieved some, some great things at that time. Uh, then two years later, um, we actually put together the first, a first of its kind phone bank at Standing Rock. I think we hired and trained 30 people uh, in the, the latest techno technology related to campaign work. Um, and that was a national campaign as well. It reached beyond just the borders of Standing Rock Nation. 
uh, we were able to uh, make phone calls to about a quarter million households around the country, Indian country specifically, calls to, to Arizona, calls to Georgia, calls to Florida, calls to North Carolina, places where the native vote was especially important in the year 2020. Uh, and it was the concept that we were working with there was natives talking to natives about the importance of voting and specifically natives from Standing Rock, which is almost certainly the most well-known tribal nation throughout the world today because of what happened, of course, in 2016, 2017 with the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle. So we wanted to figure out creative ways to leverage that power to amplify the native vote throughout the country. And the truth is the native vote is decisive in many races throughout the country. Anytime you see a very close race, any small constituency can make the difference. And so, you know, we've discovered in the 17 years that we've been doing this work that the native vote matters. It matters decisively in certain elections. And so, you know, pushing on that lever, you know, working to get native people registered, working to support transporting native people to the polls, getting them to exercise the franchise is a substantial way for us to contribute to raising the power level increasing the amount of power that Native people have in this country. Incidentally, in 2020, that was the first uh, election cycle that I think probably has ever occurred where both the presidential um, uh, victor and the vice presidential victor actually acknowledged the role that Native American people played in the election, in their, in their um, acceptance speeches. That was the first time that had ever happened to my knowledge. But it just goes to show that power goes to where the organizing is happening. It's not necessarily about numbers. It's about who's organized. So we, we at the Lakota, Lakota People's Law Project recognize the need to support effective organizing around campaign work. Of course, just you know, in, in closing my initial remarks here, I'll just mention that this last cycle, um, just you know, basically a month ago, you know, we, we produced an event in Rapid City. It was a different type of effort. It was focused on South Dakota. It was focused on the Ocheti Sokoi. It was not focused on the national Indian vote. It was focused on, you know, giving back to, to the Lakota nation. There are tribe, uh, nine different tribal nations in South Dakota, of course, approximately 80,000 people that live in the state of South Dakota, native people. We wanted to give back to them specifically and not have a focus that spread, you know, across the country. And so we produced an event that had a lot of different aspects to it. It was very exciting to be, you know, interfacing with uh, Lakota people throughout the state of South Dakota, talking to different tribal communities, dealing with different nonprofit leaders, different, you know, folks who had the capacity to kind of work with us to produce this very exciting event. We did a basketball tournament because basketball is central to uh, Native American culture these days, certainly in South Dakota. So we had young people travel from various tribal nations and compete um, in a tournament. Uh, we also uh, had a concert that was incredibly well produced. It had probably six to seven different, very well respected Native American performers, musicians. Uh, so we brought the music in. And then the following day, we did uh, Lakota hand games. Uh, it's a tournament. It's a, it's a traditional um, a competition. Chase can say more about it than I. I actually learned a lot about <laughs> Native American hand games through the experience. But that brought youth primarily from across the state to compete with one another. And it was just very rich, a very rich weekend. I estimate that we touched at least a third of eligible voters throughout the state of South Dakota, native voters that is, through the campaign because we were on the radio, we generated earned media. We distributed something like 6,000 pieces of literature throughout the Rapid City region to native communities. We just made sure everybody knew about it. Um, of course, not everybody was able to attend, but we as an organization being small, we very often produce content and then propagate that content through social media and other methods. So even if we have, you know, um, let's say we have 500 people in a given space, we can generally reach thousands, tens of thousands even, by generating that content and then propagating that across the channel. So that's, that was the, the model that we used here as well. You know, we did this event and then we made sure everybody found out about what happened at the event <laughs> afterwards. So that was, that was a profound honor to do that work. Chase, I'll kick it back to you. Those are my, my summary initial thoughts. Yes. Thank you for that. You know what? Uh, we are not outnumbered. We are out-organized, as the great Malcolm X said. We're also out-funded. We're out-privileged. And we've been 
deliberately marginalized and disenfranchised for a long time. And we're just now beginning to deconstruct that in South Dakota, in the Ocheti Shakoe, in the Republic of Lakota, we could be the deciding factor, the swing vote, the decisive electorate that any party or anyone seeking to insert themselves into the levers of politics has to entertain. They have to reach out to us. They have to respect us. They can no longer ignore us. But that is only if we assert ourselves. If we vote or if we take decisive sovereign action through what are known as tribal governments or even exercising our treaty rights. And that is where we're heading. That is where our organization is heading. That is where the tribal governments are, he are heading. Indigenous nations deserve their dignity. And we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we have an impact. But in South, I mean, we, we're at least 100,000 strong in this state. There's only one congressional rep in this state. It's 750,000 people in this state. So we should not be ignorable. So we have to take that work upon ourselves. But I want to show a video. And after this video, I'm going to make some brief comments. And then we're going to allow Chief Bear Cross to close us in prayer. But this little video will show you some highlights of the work we've done around Ocheti vote and the access to democracy for indigenous peoples. On behalf of Lakota People's Law Project, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, Lower Broome Sioux Tribe, Thunder Valley CDC, those are the named sponsors of this event that we're calling Ocheti Vote. We'll be able to start hooping right at 11. And then at 8 o'clock tonight is the beginning of Thunderfest. Stop the world and let me out. I'm tired of going. There's $2,500 cash hand games tournament. $1,800 prize for the singing contest. Like, we really want to incentivize people who carry those skills on behalf of our, our nations. Our song, our art, our dance. Th those are what we want to incentivize. That is what we want to celebrate. And, and I'm really thankful that we're a we were able to organize this event. With you I found another way to make it out to another day. That's what I see our people up here, indigenous brilliance. That's what this is. This is indigenous brilliance. This is people sharing their spirit, sharing their art, sharing their words, sharing the essence of their creativity. That blesses the whole world. Wow. Hey, you got to check those artists out. I'm going to encourage you all to maybe we should get a, a kind of a, a fuller video of that recap. We did, That's just that's all we have time for tonight. And we've we've hit the two hour mark. And we want to respect your time and certainly respect your efforts in, in joining us tonight and sharing the stream, anything that you've done. Certainly, we want to thank you for donating, for helping us out where it counts because of your help. We surpassed our goal. I just got a text just now that we hit 21.5. That's 21,500. That is amazing. I want to send our energy and our collaborative compassion to everyone out there in the philanthropic space. Every indigenous nonprofit, every social justice philanthropic organization, everybody who's trying to 
decolonize that world. I mean, that, that is, that is, there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to thank you for helping us carry our message, carry our song into this next century and in this next millennia. And with that, Lila Wopila Tanka Chichapelo, I want to welcome Chief Bear Cross back onto our our virtual stage because I rely on Brother Chief Bear Cross to, to help me out and to help the people. And he's got responsibilities that he upholds, and I would like for him to share some words and close us out in, in prayer, brother. Oh, you can't let me Yahi be a care. Ash, why are they Yahi? A care, let higher big, lay on bed to key, not hook at ash. Blehichio, me talk you up. Friends and relatives, tonight I want to thank all of you for coming and praying and talking and sharing your experience out there with the world. Tonight, my message is also across Turtle Island Indigenous country, continue to help each other, help one another. That being said, when we do Inipi, when we do Loopi, Kunkashila, the spirit of grandfather, always tells us, Unkikchilapo, Naokikchapo, Mitakuyapi. Relatives, help one another. Have pity amongst each other. That being said, relatives, today we are going to close it out with the prayer. We're going to close it out with the prayer and a Wopila Oloa. A thank you song. Oyat Hunkashila, Le Haya Piki, Le Oyate Yahipi Nawogla Kawashte, Ake Wawashte Unk Upo. We chose on the Wonglake Unk Upo. Kashila, Lehaya Piki, Pilama Polo, Kagasha, Yala Pelama, Yoye, Pilama, Yaye, Pilama, Yaye, Lo, Hai, Hawe, Charles, Ali, Wama. Kashila, Lehai Piki, Pilama Polo, Lehai Piki, Wanuri, Wakia, Wakangli, and Takuaka, Pilama Polo, Lehai Piki, Metakio, Ye, Oyas E. I want to say thank you for everybody that is listening out there. I want to say thank you again for Chase Iron Eyes, Chuck, and everybody else that is tu- turned in here. Wopila. For you, aho, etcha do you low? Dakwa se, nila wopila tanka. Wana unki glusta. Aho, hmm. We're done, relative. Doksha, doksha, akewa chiang telo. We'll see you again.